And we're live. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's the pre-show for the Security Plus Study Group. No, I remember. I know exactly why I'm here. I've only been working on this for a week. You would think I'd be completely aware of what we're doing here. I'm, I'm sort of aware of what we're doing here. So that's close. Sort of is close to being complete. We are 10 minutes away from getting started. So if you're watching this in the replay, you can fast forward about 10 minutes and you'll be at the beginning of the study group. Hello, chat room. We were chatting back and forth here and before we went live on uh, professormesser.com slash live. If you're on that page, you can chat. If you're on YouTube, you can chat. We use the YouTube chat now. So you can chat away. Hello, hello, chat room. Uh, we've got plenty to go through. I need to get uh, the presentation up. That would be good, wouldn't it? That would be good. Let's get this screen on this screen. Does it work? Is it live? Yes, it is. Excellent. And let's see if we can look at this, look at this. Yep, that's working. Cameras are up. Yep, recordings are going. See my little Cylons going down here? We also have a recording going over here. That's my streaming server. It's actually in the other room. But I have a terminal out here, a screen out here I can see. So we also got recordings going on the YouTube. So we got plenty of recordings. What else do we need to make sure? Uh, the emails and... Other messages will go out in a few minutes. I've already done the podcast audio for the the pre the the first part of the audio, the intro. I've got I think that's it. I think we're ready to go. I think we're good. And lots of folks in the chat room already. Thanks for getting here early and uh, and checking in. We've got plenty to go through today. I've got tons of questions we wrote. There's all there's some new security stuff plus I've got that I'll talk about. So there's always something. Um and we'll go through we'll go through a number of different things. Uh if you want the links to answer questions, sort of the links to other things, you can go to professormesser.com slash live. If you're on the YouTube, you can pop open a new browser window and go to professormesser.com slash QA. So that'd be good. Welcome back, North Carolina. Saudi Arabia is here. I think I saw Serbia is here. Welcome. <clears throat> We've got um, all Q&A on Security Plus today. So it's all Security Plus. Technically, I've been doing Security Plus in my head for the past three, four, five months, six months, really, when I started this uh, last project of mine. We'll talk about the project in a bit. Paris, Tennessee is here. Germany's here. South Carolina checking in. There's Huntsville. Orlando is here. So Florida folks, welcome. From Canada, originally from Hungary, welcome. Like when Canada checks in, Mrs. Professor Messer always likes to know that. D.C. is here. Thank you. Alaska, Socrative, Socrative app. That's what you're looking for. It's the Socrative student app. There's DC again. Philly, hello. Colorado, Nigeria is here again. Thank you. Welcome. Senegal, New Jersey, Virginia, Maryland, Puerto Rico. Welcome. Garland, Texas, UK is here. I'm glad we're able to get a good mix of who the, the, Folks that are on the few hours east of me, a few hours west of me. I like that we're able to do that. There's Dallas, Phoenix, Peru. Welcome. Hey, Georgia. I don't know if that's Georgia or Georgia. It could be one or the other, seeing how people are checking in. Saudis here. Welcome. Conroe, Texas. There's Maryland, my Maryland again. Welcome. California, ATL. I hope you're not at the airport. Atlanta checking. Two Atlantas in a row there. Florida. Thank you, Florida. My folks in Florida. Puerto Rico again. But where in Puerto Rico? Are you in San Juan? Are you in Caguas? Where are you? There's Washington. Is it Washington or Washington? 
North Carolina, Utah, Denver, uh, Germany, Taiwan. There's lots of D.C. checking in. Welcome. Hey, Jamaica. Sierra Vista, Arizona. I was thinking about Arizona. There's something in my head about Arizona this week. I can, now I can't remember what it was. Maybe I was talking with the Mrs. Professor Messer about that. There's Morocco. Orlando again. Columbus, Ohio. Welcome. Juan Adias, Puerto Rico. Uh, let's go to see if we got Switzerland is here. India, lots of folks from all over. Thank you for being here. Uh, I like doing these. It's always fun to go through some Q&A, hang out, answer questions, see what's going on. I'm in this little dark room for most of the week. It's nice to have now, now I can talk to people. Uh, the Socrative student app is what we use to answer questions. You can, there's a question up on my screen right now that you will eventually see. You go to the Socrative student app to answer those questions. It will ask you for a room name. The room name is Professor Messer, all one word, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E yes, there are quite a few game references in my video lectures. I do a bit of gaming here and there. So yes, I'm not a big Counter Strike fan, not actually not 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 a fan, but uh, that requires reflexes. And at this point in my life, the kids absolutely annihilate me on anything that is a reflex shooter, quick bang bang kind of thing. If it's a slow, or it's a it's a type of shooter that doesn't require the first shot and you're dead, then I can I can work with that. So something like the division where it's not immediate, boom, you're dead. And I'm not talking about the PvP part, but the PvE part where there's some strategy and you've got some different weapons. That's fun. I do uh, some EVE Online. That's pretty good. Again, not a lot of PvP. See, that's the thing. Not really into the fighting. I, I need something to sort of relax I need two hours of something to relax at the end of the day. And um, doing doing uh, hurry up and shoot isn't one of those things. Not really into Fortnite. Same kind of, same reason, really. You have to do everything so quick, 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 bang, bang, you're dead. That's not, that's not fun for anybody. Nobody wants that. So I, I do enjoy, I uh, used to do a lot of WoW, World of Warcraft. I do some Eve now. But, it, but it's like this two-hour block. You, like, get in for two hours, and then I'm out. It's You can't even get anything going at that point. It's somewhat challenging because you can't actually get any traction. You know what I mean? Um, so I have to find something where I can do something sort of mindless but still provide enough challenge to keep me interested in that kind of thing. Uh, so that's what I'm working on these days. I can't say working on. Just kind of hit there and we're there. So no, not. I like the chat room, though. They always go straight to the 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 old people things. Oh, you do an Oregon Trail? Are you just doing some crossword puzzles? Is that what you're... No, that's not what I'm doing. I do like Borderlands. I haven't played the latest, which just came out. Uh, I did like that. Plenty of time on the Borderlands 2. But even that, at some point. It's a minesweeper. You do a minesweeper? That's right. I just sit here for hours and play minesweeper. <laughs> oh. I, I got, uh, I, I used to play a ton of Division. Division 2 sort of, they sort of messed some things up with that one, so... Not so much Division 2 anymore, but uh, now I've kind of shifted over to EVE Online because there's so many different things you can do. You can spend a couple hours doing a thing, and then the next time you can do something completely different. So we'll see. Hello, India. Diablo. I love Diablo. I used to do a lot of Diablo, too. I was getting pretty good with that. Enjoy that, too. Welcome, Massachusetts. Alpharetta's here. Welcome. I don't, I don't do Minesweeper. I can't... Uh, so that is Spaceball, Spaceball, Pinball. 
I love the pinball and Windows XP. Are you kidding? Who didn't like that? Well, speaking of liking something, I would like to get started with this. It's 12 noon. It's time to get started. Let's see if we can get the stream going. Let's see if I can remember how any of this works. Here we go, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the September 2019 Professor Messer Security Plus Study Group coming to you live here from Messer Studios. Welcome. My name is James Messer. I will be your host for this next hour of Q&A. Well, actually, this first hour, I'm going to ask you questions, and then we, we officially end the study group, and then we have a study group after show where you can ask me questions. So it's a little bit of both. If you are watching this live, there's a live chat. We've been talking back and forth about completely ridiculous things for the last 10 minutes getting ready to go and making sure everything was ready to go here. Thanks for joining us there. You're welcome to join us also for that chat. We'd love to have you there. There's plenty to talk about today regarding Security Plus. So glad you're joining us. We will be going through, and I'll be explaining in just a moment, how you can answer these questions live with me. These are all brand new questions. I write them for every study group. You haven't seen these questions before, so stick around. And we'll talk all about that. Thanks for your ongoing support, by the way. Following me on Twitter, you go to professormesser.com slash Twitter. If you want to join us and subscribe on the YouTube, you can go to professormesser.com slash YouTube. And as you can probably figure out by now, you put in the name of the social media thing you would like to find me on. So professormesser.com slash Instagram takes me to the Professor Messer page on Instagram. So there's always something to do there. Uh, this particular study group brought to you by the Professor Messer course notes. This is something that a lot of you have sent me messages and said, hey, this is actually a nice summary of everything that's in your videos. So I know there's a, over 100 videos for Security Plus. What I've done is taken all of my content for the Security Plus videos and put everything into one single PDF document. There's also a printed version as well. So all of the details about Security Plus, here's the PDF right here. This is 94 pages long, 93, 94. It's pretty long. But everything that's in my videos is separated out by video, all the text, all the graphics, all the details, everything that will help you summarize everything that's in your Security Plus videos. Uh, of course, you could take your own notes, and I highly, highly recommend that you take as many notes as you can, but not everybody has time to go through every single video that happens to be on the website and take their own notes. There's also a physical version of this. This is the, exactly the same thing, except in a physical book form, full color, same information, except it's uh, something that is printed out onto a uh, nice, high-quality quality book. I really like this book. Like the way it turned out, Mrs. Professor Messer said, you need a physical version of it. So this is the physical edition of the course notes. And if you buy the physical edition, I realize it's a little more expensive because we have to print it. It's in full color. There's costs associated with that. But if you do buy this, you get the digital version for free. So thank you for your ongoing support with those study group course notes. Uh, this is something that does help keep the website up and running. So thank you for doing that. That's uh, an important part of this too, is of course, all of the videos uh, for Security Plus are all free to watch online. So you've got some, some options there uh, that now you have some notes that you can go with to be able to see that. We do have this study group recorded, of course. You can watch the video replay on my website. And we also have podcast versions of this. So if you'd like an audio-only version, you can listen to in your car. It would download automatically to your podcast app. You can get that at professormesser.com slash podcast. Also, here's something new. Here's a new announcement. I'm going to be doing a weekly Security Plus pop quiz question. You all, you've only been asking for this for how many months now? So finally, I'm committing. And if you subscribe now, professormesser.com slash emails, I think I, I created the link there. It's also from my homepage. There is on the right-hand side a, a, li a link there that you can go to to subscribe to my A+, plus, Network+, plus, and Security+, plus pop quiz questions. So I will have those available to you. You can uh, put in your email address there. And I believe tomorrow will be the first weekly one. I haven't actually put it into the system yet. So this will be what I'm doing tonight. Instead of gaming, I will be working on making sure the pop quizzes will go out tomorrow. So there's a little something there to be able to work on. Uh, if you do show up 
tomorrow or the next day. It takes us about a day or so. We go through this entire study group, and Lori, my marketing manager, has to listen to me do this entire thing so that she can put timestamps into the YouTube video description. So later on, if you want to come back to any of these videos and quickly find information that you're looking for, this may be a very easy way to do it. All the timestamps are there. You simply click on the timestamp, and we'll take you to that exact place in the video, and you're able to find whatever you're looking for. So thanks to Lori, we're able to have that. Thanks, Lori. I know she's listening, so we'll give her a wave. A lot of you are on my website often, and you know there's an online chat right at the bottom. So when we're not doing a live stream, there's still a chat on my website that you can enjoy. It's there 24 by 7. I'm obviously not looking at it now because we're doing the live stream, but I'll look at it after we're done here. It will certainly be available. Uh, I spend a lot of time in Discord because I'm in a lot of different Discords. So I made a Discord at ProfessorMesser.com slash Discord that you could enjoy. Uh, I don't know exactly what we're going to do with that. Maybe you'll use it. Maybe you won't use it. Maybe there'll be something you can take advantage. But I'm, I'm always on Discord, so why not also be there as well? I want you to find the information you need as easily as possible, and that's one easy way to do it. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about how we can do more of these Q&As in just a moment. Very quickly, though, I will also remind you, a lot of you uh, don't have a way to directly support the site with dollars, but there is a way that you can support us. If you're purchasing anything on Amazon, you can go to professormesser.com slash Amazon, and you can purchase things from there as well. You pay the same price in Amazon, but Amazon gives us a little bit of your purchase so that we're able to keep things running here, and we appreciate your support and being able to do that. Today, we're going to talk all about Security Plus. The questions that I'm going to be giving you today are from the latest Security Plus version. This is the SY0501. This was released on October the 4th of 2017. This means that in October of 2020, about a year or so from now, we may see a new version of Security Plus show up. We probably will. They do this in three-year increments. So right now, you're absolutely studying the right information. You have plenty of time to study. And by the way, when that new version comes out three years from now, the 501 will probably still be around for another six months after that. So you've got a year and six months, pretty much, of being able to do that. Um, so this is the right version. Make sure all of your study materials are for the SY0501. Do not use study materials for a previous version. This is a 90-minute exam. You can get a maximum of 90 questions. And your score is needs to be a 750 on a range from 100 to 900. That's a pretty aggressive score. So you have to know your stuff to get that Security Plus all taken care of. This is a multiple choice question and performance-based questions. We'll talk more about what that is in just a moment. Today, many of you are asking in the chat room, how do we ask a question? How do we answer these questions? We'll talk more about answering first. We'll do asking in about an hour from now. So if you want to follow along with us and answer questions, if you are watching this live, you can use this link. Pop open a new browser window. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. That's the link you want to go to. You could also use an app on your mobile device. This is called the Socrative Student app. You don't want the Socrative Teacher app. That's the one for me. This is the Socrative Student app. It will ask you for a room name. That room name is Professor Messer. If you are watching this on a replay, unfortunately, this live functionality is not available to you. But always check in. You never know when we're doing something live. Go to professormesser.com slash calendar, and you can find out when the next live event is going to be. We'd love to have you follow along with us. Now, if you did all of those things properly, there's a question there waiting for you. This is a question from last month. We call this our study group re rewind question just to make sure that you're able to get in and answer these questions on the study group rewind. Here's the question. It asks, a malicious application has circumvented your wireless access point and is communicating directly between devices. Which of the following would best describe this technique? And as you can probably see, there are options available right on your screen. Is it VLAN, NAT, static routing? virtualization, or ad hoc. So a malicious application has circumvented your wireless access point is communicating directly between devices. Which of the following would best describe this technique? Is it VLAN, NAT, static routing, virtualization, or ad hoc? And as you can see on the screen, as you punch in your answer and submit it, 
I see what these answers are in real time. You can see 87% of you say it's ad hoc. If we had to go with the odds, I would probably go with that one along with you. So you'll notice there's other things here to work through. Now, if you wanted to answer these, your goal here is to absolutely participate. We'd love to have you to do, have you do that. Make sure that you go to professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answers. We're going to pretend we're taking the exam. So please don't put any answers in the chat room. Please don't put any hints in the chat room. We want to make sure that you're able to find exactly what you want and don't spoil it for anyone. And in fact, you got it absolutely right. That is the right answer. It's ad hoc. That's the one. Ad hoc is when you're able to communicate between wireless devices without using an access point. So it's point-to-point -point communication. A lot of times we don't even realize. We're so used to connecting to the access point and using the access point, we almost forget that, oh, yeah, there is a way we can communicate directly between devices, and that is with an ad hoc communication. That is the right answer. If you answered E ad hoc, you got exactly the right answer with that. Now, when we were uh, talking earlier, I described the type of questions you would get on the exam as questions that would be uh, multiple choice, just like the one we just had. That was a multiple choice question where you have five different options or four different options, and you get to choose between one of those as the correct answer. But CompTIA, at the very beginning of the exam, will give you a handful of performance-based questions. That's what they call these. Performance-based questions are questions that are not multiple choice questions. And if you're not ready for this, this will throw you. So make sure you're aware that the first set of questions you get will seem very much different than a multiple choice question. And some people will, will get thrown when that happens. So don't worry. These are normal. You get a, uh, I say a handful. You could get three, you could get seven, somewhere in there. You're not going to get a huge number of them, but there will be a number of performance-based questions to go through. There are different strategies for answering these. A number of you will jump past the performance-based questions, go right to the multiple choice, and then come back at the end to answer performance-based. I think that's a pretty good strategy. Some people like getting the performance-based questions out of the way immediately. That's up to you. So figure out why that happens to be. And maybe you you will look at that and understand, yes, that's exactly uh, the, the way you would like to do it. Find the one that works for you. So what I like to do in these study groups is to give you a performance-based question. So our first question of the study group, and you can go back to a year's worth of study groups, our very first question is always a performance-based question. It's a new question. You've never seen this before. I write these just for the study group. And here is our performance-based question of the month. This question asks, match the device to the description. So I have five devices here. I have a proxy, a load balancer, an IPS, a SIM, and a NAC. So those are five devices. And I have five descriptions. So this one, this one should be a little bit easier. Sometimes they give you more descriptions than devices or vice versa so that some are left over. On this one, there's nothing left over. So I gave you kind of the easy version of this one. So here are the five different descriptions. One is create an uptime report for the last 24 hours. The next is block a known network attack. The third description is filter on a category of URL. Description D is require authentication when connecting to the network. And the last description is maintain uptime if a server fails. So those are your five descriptions, your five devices. It's a one-to-one -one in being able to do this. Now, uh, you'll notice on your Socrative that it simply puts you into a fill-in-the-blank for this particular question. So you can put these in by using the abbreviations. I've numbered the devices one through five. I've numbered the descriptions a through E, technically not a number. So if you think they're already in order, it would be 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, and 5E. See how easy that is? Except they're not in that order. You have to go through each one of these. So for those that are listening on the podcast, let's go through these one more time. We have a proxy, a load balancer, a proxy, a load balancer, an IPS, a SIM, and a NAC. Those are the five different devices. Description A is create an uptime report for the last 24 hours. 
Description B is block a known network attack. Description C is filter on a category of URL. Description D is require authentication when connecting to the network. And description E is maintain uptime if a server fails. So the best way to answer this would be to go to professormesser.com slash QA. That's the way to do it. Now, if you do not see a question in your Socrative, then you're probably in the wrong room. The room name, obviously, is Professor Messer, all one word, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -E -E you would like to answer, don't answer in the chat room. You want to go to this link right at the bottom, professormesser.com slash QA to be able to answer that question. So just pop open a new browser window, a new browser tab, and go directly to that. Yes, the question is live and sitting there and waiting for you to answer. It's a fill in the room, or fill in the blank question for the room. If you are in Socrative, the name of that room is Professor Messer, all one word. You can find the details of that on professormesser.com slash live. The room name, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E Make sure you spell it right or there won't be anything there. You'll be in a room all by yourself. That'd be sad. Don't, don't do that. That's why I put that link there, professormesser.com slash QA. takes you right there. You don't have to type anything in. You can't misspell anything. It's a great way to do it. So feel free to have that, have those things available to you. Whenever I start uh, working on and thinking about how we're going to do and step through these, hopefully this will give you an idea of the matching that you could be faced with during an actual exam. So let's see how you did with this one. Let's go through each one of these. We'll start with the proxy. The question first was, which one of these was a proxy? Well, that would be C, filter on a category of URL. Now, obviously, proxies provide many different capabilities. They can provide firewall capabilities. They can scan for viruses. They can provide caching capabilities. And filtering on a category of URLs, very common use for a proxy. So if you have a proxy in your environment, you could be doing URL filtering by taking advantage of some of those functions of a proxy. Proxies these days, though, not really used so much. Proxies are kind of the older technologies that you would run into. Proxies tend to break applications. Uh, they're difficult to manage. They don't scale very well. And there's so many much better, much faster technologies out to be able to do this that we're seeing proxies kind of fade out as firewalls, the latest generation of firewalls is certainly coming on strong. We also have the second option, which is load balancer. If a server fails, it would be great to have a load balancer there because you could have multiple servers in place and then be able to simply balance the load to all of the servers that are left running. If you're on professormesser.com right now, for example, you are connecting to a server that is part of a load balancer. There are multiple servers balancing the load between all of these. If I lose one of these servers, let's hope that doesn't happen. But if I was to, the other server would be available and everything hopefully would still be running. Now, is everything on a load balancer that I have? No, not everything. There's always a point of failure somewhere. That's why the challenges with the security uh, issues and management issues of anybody's network, but a load balancer will go a long way to be able to do this. The third is an IPS. If you chose B, block a known network attack, that is exactly what you would find with an IPS. That is, that is a detailed, very useful tool to be able to find attacks that are inbound and stop them before they get into the network. So make sure that you're able to go through those. The last is a SIM. A SIM is A, create an uptime report for the last 24 hours. That's security information, an event manager. That's a fantastic tool to have. It is uh, an incredibly powerful reporting tool. It consolidates log files from many, many different devices and allows you to create all different kinds of reports. So having an re uptime report for the last 24 hours is right in the wheelhouse for a SIM. And for those of you that have SIMs in your environment, you know how powerful they are and how great they are to have them. It's a great tool if you're doing anything with security. And lastly, a NAC. Well, the only thing left is D, require authentication when connecting to the network. A, a NAC, network authentication, is an incredibly important piece of this. Uh, the part that I think a lot of people even miss is being able to have one centralized network 
authentication point becomes useful to be able to keep people off of the network. So nobody can do anything on the network unless they authenticate to the centralized method. Uh, and a NAC helps facilitate some of that on, an, on a fully implemented network access control mechanism. This NAC will not only provide you access to the network, but it might change the configuration of where you're connecting to move you into particular VLAN, for example. So if you're part of the marketing department and you log in, it might automatically move you to the marketing VLAN. So there's some extra capabilities involved when you're doing anything with NAC. Kind of nice to have that there. So that is a good example of a matching question. This might also be a fill in the blank. It might also be a drag and drop question on the exam. It might be presented to you in many different ways. The one we did today was a bit of a matching question. But these are the types of questions you should be ready for. Notice that questions like this did not ask you for a definition. For instance, NAC didn't ask you, what does NAC stand for? Network access control. It's already assuming you know that NAC is network access control. What it wants to know is, what does that do? What value does that bring to the network? How do you use that? And those are the things that are going to be important for your exam. So hopefully you were able to get some of those right. Some of you in the chat room said, yes, we were able to get some of those. And in fact, these are useful things to know for your exam. Let's now move to the next question and do a multiple choice question. Here we are. We're going to go to the next multiple choice question, which asks, which of the following could be used to obtain the banner of a service? Which of the following could be used to obtain the banner of a service? Would it be? TCP dump, netcat, dig, traceroute, and netstat. Those are the five different options. And we're going to talk about this question in a moment. Uh, the question asks, which of the following could be used to obtain the banner of a service? The options are TCP dump, netcat, dig, traceroute, and netstat. If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. Please don't put answers in the chat room. No hints in the chat room. We're going to figure this out all on our own. And then we'll, of course, we'll all see what the answer happens to be. One of the things that's important with this particular question is as I'm reading through them, I'm thinking I might be able to get this answer. I could probably choose two, maybe three of these. Definitely two of these could be an answer, but you do have to think about how we connect to these services these days and what tools would work to be able to do that. Only one of these answers, 100% of the time, would be able to provide you with the banner of a service. And all five of these tools that I've listed here, TCP dump, netcat, dig, traceroute, and netstat, those are all five actual tools that you need to know for the Security Plus exam. So make sure you're familiar with those. Um, each one of the, those is important to know. If there's any of those you're looking at and you're thinking, I'm not really sure which one of those it is or what that particular tool does, that's your, that's your cue to be able to go back to that particular tool and figure out more details about what that particular functionality is. Those utilities are very, very powerful to have. Let's see how you did with this one. Which of the following could be used to obtain the banner of a service? How do we do? We're not quite sure. We're a little torn on this one. 39% of you is uh, chose netcat because it has cats in it. Of course you would choose that. 23% of you said TCP dump would be how you would do that. 18% said dig, practically a tie, 17% said netstat, and only 4% of you said traceroute. So those are the five options. If we went with not a majority, but we have a plurality of answers, 39% of you chose netcat, that would be the one we would go with if we had to ask the audience. And indeed, it's netcat. That's what you would use to be able to grab that information directly from the network and concatenate it to your screen or to a file. That's the one you would like to use. It's great because it's able to pull this information off the network. You know, we use the copy command when we're at a command prompt to be able to copy a file. What if we could copy network traffic? That's what Netcat does for us. 
we're able to have Netcat make a request out to a device, and we're able to see the responses that come back on this Netcat utility. And we're able to do a lot of different things with that. Uh, this is an extremely useful tool if you're trying to get information about a banner, because often when you first connect to a service, there's banner information that is sent back to you across the network that often you don't even see. The application is able to use the banner information, but it's never presented to your screen. But by using Netcat, you can grab that network information, present it to your screen, and be able to see that. So those of you that did answer B Netcat, 41% of you got that one absolutely right. Now, why wouldn't it be TCP dump? That would be valid if we could guarantee that every single one of the services that we ever use on the network are communicating in the clear. And that's the real challenge today is that our emails are sent encrypted, our web pages are sent encrypted. These services that we use on the network are very often encrypted. And that also means that you actually have to be capturing this information when the banner comes across. TCP dump doesn't make the request for the banner. It simply passively captures whatever happens to be on the network. So not the best answer to obtain the banner of a service. If you had all of those things in place, that it was in the clear, that it was, and we're assuming you don't have access to the decryption key, but it's in the clear, and it happened to go across the network at that time, then TCP dump could be used for that. Not the best answer for this question, though. The best answer, and the one you should always be looking for in your exam is the best answer, is Netcat. Now, why wouldn't it be Dig? Dig is uh, Dig's pretty rad, dude. Dig's awesome. Are you digging it? Dig is very useful for gathering information from a name server, being able to resolve a name from an IP address or an IP address to a name. It is uh, effectively what we're using these days to be able to query name services and gather that information. Netstat is network statistics, provides you with tons of information about the statistics of what devices and servers your machine happens to be connecting to and what servers happen to be connecting to your machine what other devices might be connecting to your machine. So all of those, very useful, but it doesn't gather banner information. So Netstat would not be the useful term, but I use Netstat all the time. Incredibly useful to have that there. Uh, and of course, trace route, as the name implies, is able to trace uh, the routes between your device and another device on the network. You're able to see all the different routes in between. All five of those utilities are important to know for your Network Plus exam. So if you aren't familiar, you don't know those very well, those would be things to study. Make sure you're very familiar with them. The answer in this particular case is indeed Netcat. That was the one we were looking for. Hopefully, you were able to identify that one as being the tool that you would use. Let's do another per, uh, multiple choice question. I have one here waiting for you. Let's move on to this question that asks, a system administrator would like to limit account permissions to the minimum required for the user to complete their assigned tasks. Which of these would best describe this? So I have some options for you. Would it be A, least functionality, B, EAL, C is application whitelisting, D is TPM, and answer E is FDE. Now, if you think you know what those answers are, you can lock those in at professormesser.com slash QA. Make sure you go there. Please don't answer in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. We're going to figure this out on our own. A system administrator would like to limit account permissions to the minimum required for the user to complete their assigned tasks. Which of these would best describe this? Would it be least functionality, EAL, application whitelisting, TPM, or FDE. All five of those useful things to know for your Security Plus exam, but only one that fits best here. So in the chat room, some people were mentioning there were lots of those tools, very useful to have those there. Remember, the trace route is sort of a generic name that can be used. There is a trace route available for Linux, but there's also trace route for Windows. It's just an abbreviated name, trace RT for trace route. Dig used in Linux, there's also a dig for Windows. So those aren't specific to an operating system. You can find these utilities available for almost any operating system to be able to do that. Hopefully, you're familiar with some of those tools. You should, tr you should absolutely be familiar with them. You need to make sure that you can at least use those at command line 
and be familiar with that. So that's one that, of course, being able to do that is important. Dig is available. I mentioned in my uh, videos, you can download Dig and, and install on your Windows machine. It's just not available as part of the operating system right there. So another one to think about. Let's see how we did with this one, though. A system administrator would like to limit account permissions to the minimum required for the user to complete their assigned tasks. Which of these would best describe this? We have 75% of you say it is least functionality. We've got 9%, 8%, a tie for second for EAL and application whitelisting. 6% say it's TPM. And then 2% say it's FDE. All of these, of course, real things. So make sure you know what all of these are. 75% of you, that's pretty strong to know what the answer is for this one. Least functionality, that's exactly what it is. Least functionality means that we're only going to give people the access they need, the minimum access they need to be able to do their job. This is an incredibly important concept in IT security. It is a concept that is constantly broken in IT security. Uh, there are so many times you'll walk into an organization and everybody has local administrator rights on their machine. That is certainly not least functionality. And if anything, it is the exact functionality that malware needs to be successful. So that is not what you want to have on somebody's system. Very often, the, the security was just never a concern or people felt that security was getting in the way. So instead of making things the proper type of security, they instead just made everything wide open. And that's really why this particular least functionality idea becomes incredibly important for you. Make sure you're familiar with these. So there might be different configurations to make this a least functionality. Maybe you want to disable the ability to install printer drivers. Maybe you want to disable the ability to change the system time. These are almost the things that you don't want to, to even know that there's an issue. Notice that these are a little bit different than privileges, though. These are little. These are slightly different uh, in being able to work through this. This least functionality is exactly what we want to think about. We are configuring these and making sure that people are only able to do what they need to do. So that's exactly the right answer. 76% of you say it's the least functionality. That's what you want to have available. Make sure you're familiar with those. The EAL was the one where you're, you're thinking about uh, a system that is designed to perform to a particular set of security requirements. Those are the EAL. Very often see those in government-type situations. Application whitelisting would allow certain applications to run, but not other applications to run. Here we're talking about account permissions and the minimum required capabilities. Uh, the TPM is Trusted Platform Module. This is cryptographic hardware that is hopefully on many of your devices used for cryptographic functions. In fact, TPM is very often used for full disk encryption, or FDE. So those are the ones that you would work through. So very good. If you answered least functionality, answer A, 76% of you got that one absolutely right. Now, if you're going through these questions and you're wondering, there's a, there's a lot here. There's a lot of these questions. These exams are asking me to recall a lot of information, and I could not agree more. And the Security Plus exam itself has its own set of challenges because it has its own way of asking questions. So what I did is I sat down and created a series of practice exams, three separate practice exams that have the same cadence, the same style, the same way of talking as the actual exam. I tried to take the same voice of the exam and create questions that not only sound similar, but they have the same type of difficulty as the Security Plus exam does. This is one where if you ever in a situation where you're trying to get more information about, am I ready to take the exam? Do I really know this stuff? It's always important to do Q&A. I always talk about those four important things. Watch some videos, get some good books, get plenty of hands-on, and get lots and lots of Q&A. And so I have created these, these practice exams to be able to do that. But I also want to take this to the next level. We've got all these videos available. So I wanted to give you some different ways to do it. If you go to professormesser.com slash security PE for security practice exams, you'll be able to download the sample that's there. And I've got the sample that can kind of take you through a number of these questions. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Not only do I have performance-based questions 
on this exam. There's five performance-based questions for every single one of these practice exams. So you have 15 of those available to go through. But also, the, the multiple choice questions are here as well. So you've got questions like this one, like which of these protocols use TLS to provide secure communications? And you would select two from that. And there's not only a quick answer that can just tell you, well, here's the right answer, but there's also one that gives you the details of the answer. I'm going to click that, and that takes me right to a section of the website that brings me to that page, the exact page that answers which of these two protocols use TLS to provide secure communication. I give you the answer, and I explain to you why that answer is the right answer, but I also give you all the incorrect answers, and I explain every single one of the incorrect answers as well. Another thing you'll notice with this is I never assume that you know what the abbreviation is either. I try to spell out the abbreviations for every single one of these answers, at least the first time we use it there. And then at the bottom, I give you more information right here for secure protocols. And I include, if you've got the book version of this, which should be out uh, probably next week, there'll be a physical book version of this available. You can use your phone, camera, and just point your camera at that. You don't have to take a picture of it. In fact, you could do this right now if you're watching this on the video. You can point your camera at this. Uh, don't take a picture of it. Just point it. And you'll notice a pop-up will show up in your camera. If you click on that, it takes you to this video that describes the information that you were asked for this particular question. That is available for every single one of the answers that are in these practice exams. So a lot of you have said, I need more Q&A. And if you've been around the internet, you know that the quality of Q&A varies widely. Some of it's very good. Some of it is incredible incredibly bad. Well, these are questions, every single one of them I have written. So I know these are the highest quality questions you can get. I tried to make them match the difficulty level of the exam. Maybe it's something you can use. And of course, just like our, our the, the study guides that I have available and all my course notes, these will also help what we're doing here on the website. You can find out more about the practice exams. They're available at professormesser.com slash security PE. There's also uh, this digital version for $20. There'll be a physical version, I hope, available next week. Should be arriving uh, here in the studio on Friday. I get to make sure it looks okay. And if it does, there'll be a physical version. You can always upgrade to the physical version later if you would like to do that. Thank you for your support also of this. A lot of you said this is what we need, and hopefully this is something you'll be able to use for your exam. Let's do more questions, more and more Q&A. Here's the next question on our list that asks, when checking out laptops, employees must provide a signature. Which of the following would best describe this authentication factor? Would it be something you are, something you have, something you do, somewhere you are, or something you know? When checking out laptops, employees must provide a signature. Which of the following would best describe this authentication factor? Is it something you are, something you have, something you do, somewhere you are, or something you know? If you think you know the answer to this, go to professormesser.com slash QA. And you can try this particular answer. See if you know what this happens to be. Authentication factor is a big part of the exam. Huge section on authentication. And the authentication factors, of course, are mentioned there. And they are probably going to show up on your exam somewhere, somehow. Yes, we're not just checking it out. Like, hey, let's check out this laptop. No, we're, we are, someone is taking the laptop home. We are assigning this laptop to them. And in the process of assigning this laptop to them, it is checked out to them. <laughs> so that's, that was, that's what that means. We are not there with a magnifying glass. Let us check out this laptop. No, no. This is us taking the laptop away. And in order for you to take this laptop, you must sign out this laptop. Seems, seems crazy, but that's uh, the way it's done. In this particular organization, that's the way it's done. And able to have those there. Which one would it be? What authentication factor would we use for this? If you don't know your authentication factors quickly, you know them solid, then make sure you spend some extra time on these. These will almost certainly come up somewhere on the exam in some way. So make sure you're very familiar with what these are. When checking out laptops, employees must provide a signature. 
Which of the following would best describe this authentication factor? 65% of you say it's something you do. Not quite as strong as the last one we were answering. We've got almost a three-way tie for second between something you are, something you have, and something you know. And lastly, 1%. Only a small 1% say somewhere you are. So those are your five different options. 65% have said something you do. Should we go with that one as the answer? I think we should because that is a signature. That is something we do that is specific to us. That's one of the beauties of a signature. It's very difficult for someone to be able to duplicate a signature. It's one that is very unique. Obviously, people can. There have been times when people have forged signatures, but it's so uncommon because it's so difficult to be able to do that. Something you do. Handwriting is a very good way to, to have something that you do to be able to do this. If we even took it to uh, a very specific level, there have been studies done that evaluate how people type. And the way that they type is something that they do. In fact, you may have a certain password you type in, and when you type it in, it's almost sing-songy in the way that you type it. And then if you have someone else type the same password, it doesn't have quite the same ring to it, does it? So the way that you type, the, the way the keystrokes are put into the keyboard, actually something you do. So something you do is the authentication factor you would use here. This is, somebody mentioned earlier, this is sort of biometric -y, but not really. Because this is not part of you. It's not a physical part of what you are. It's not technically biometrics. But very careful, very, very close to that. Very, very similar in the way that biometrics works because you are the one doing it. But it is not biometrics to have those things there. We have other options here, of course. Something you are would be a biometric. It would be a fingerprint. It would be an iris scan. It would be a voice print. It would be your face. That is something that you are. Something you have might be your mobile phone. Maybe you get an SMS message. Maybe you get, uh, maybe there's an app on your phone that you use to be able to bring up a pseudo random number generator. And so having your phone allows you to have a separate authentication factor as something you have with you. We know something you do somewhere you are. If, as we are authenticating, we're able to prove that we happen to be in a certain location, a GPS coordinate, for example, that would be somewhere you are. And then something you know would be a password. It would be a personal identification number. It would be something that only you knew. The only way to get that information is to get it out of your brain. It's something that you know to be able to do that. So very good. If you did answer C, along with 65% of you, Something you do was the right answer for that one as well. Let's do another uh, multiple choice question. Let's do one on security controls. Here's the question that asks, which of the following would be considered a corrective security control? Which of the following would be considered a corrective security control? Would it be backups, man trap, login banner, Motion detector, security policy. There's your five different security controls. All five, obviously, pretty important security controls. One of them would be a corrective security control. Is it backups, man trap, login banner, motion detector, or security policy? If you think you know the answer, no answer in the chat room. You want to go to professormesser.com slash QA. It stands for something. I'm not sure. ProfessorMesser.com slash QA is where you want to lock in your answer. Obviously, if you're watching this in the replay, there's nothing there. Sometimes I'll get an email to say, I'm, I'm trying to answer these. Well, we're not live. You have to be here when we're live. And you want to know when the live is, you can always go to ProfessorMesser.com slash calendar, and you'll be able to find out exactly when the next live event is going to be. I'll only say that again maybe four or five times to be able to be able to do that. Hopefully that would work for you. And maybe it is QA is for quack. Maybe that's no, it's not. That's it's got to stand for something. It's got to be there somehow to have that capability there. Security controls. There are a lot of different security controls. You need to be able to make sure you know what the different security controls are and some examples 
of what those security controls are. Let's see what you thought these security controls might be. How do we do? We're a little torn. 43% of you say backups is a corrective security control. 39% of you, almost a tie, say that it's security policy is a corrective security control. 8%, 6%, and 5% say man trap, login banner, and motion detector, respectively. So security control is incredibly useful to know about. The ones that are corrective are the ones that fix the problem. They mitigate or correct when a particular issue occurs. So for example, IPS can block someone who is attacking you and effectively correct the network flow to allow the good traffic but block the bad traffic. Uh, backups, if you have a ransomware, you walk in on Monday morning, all your machines are locked. All of your data on those machines is encrypted. How can you correct that particular problem? Through a corrective security control by restoring from backup. So that's a very, I, I wish a more common way as a corrective security control. It's perhaps a corrective security control we don't use enough is to have our backups available. Same thing if a storm hits, they, they take out all of your lightning hits the building, all of your equipment gets fried. Perhaps your corrective security control is to use a backup site to be able to do that. So those, were, those are pretty useful to have that functionality there. Uh, let's talk about what some of these others might be then. If we were going to look at these, we know that backups is our right answer. Backups is a corrective security control, something that you would be able to have there. A man trap is a physical security control. If I remember my own videos correctly, it is a physical device that will only allow you through to have that there. Motion detector is the detective security control. It's actually in the name. Oh, so close. So the 4% of you that chose motion detector, you were so close with that one. To have it there. Security policy, 36% of you said security policy. That is an administrative security control. Security policies don't stop anything. They don't correct anything. They don't, they're not a physical, they don't stop you. There's not a, not a fence. It's not a man trap. Uh, security policy, purely administrative which can help identify what is appropriate and not appropriate, but doesn't correct anything. Never has, <laughs> never will, unfortunately, to be able to do that. So hopefully that's one that you're thinking about correcting and having those there. Uh, corrective security controls, very useful to have the backups there to correct these problems and have that issue available. That would be the right answer is a backups. Got that one absolutely right. That is the correct answer. So you can restore from those. There, that's your corrective part and having that there. That's one be very useful to have those security controls available. Now, one thing people are mentioning in the chat room, and this is important to consider, some of these will fit into multiple categories. And you will see this across the different security controls. So having uh, backups available might fit into more than just the corrective security control, but that wasn't the question. The question wasn't, tell me all the different security controls backups fits in. This particular question said, which of the following would be considered a corrective security control? So those are the differences. Make sure, in fact, if you go through the video specific to these, and I always put the video right here at the bottom, section 5.7, security controls is the name of the video. Some of these do show up in more than one place, and that's why. Make sure you're familiar with that. Don't let that throw you. It's never an exclusive thing when it comes to security controls because some of these do fit into different categories. Make sure you're familiar with that as you go through them. If you're watching this video for continuing education unit credit, I would be glad to send you an email that has been digitally signed by me that says you must have watched this because you followed these exact instructions to be able to earn that email. So listen closely. So here we go. What you want to do is go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There is a Contact Us link. In that Contact Us link, make sure you put your name. Obviously, put your email address. I very often get bounces back. Unfortunately, make sure you have the right email address in there. 
And in the, the subject line, it's nice if you put this is the September 2019 Security Plus Study Group. And if you can fit the super secret code word of the month in there, which is corrective, we'll use that. I think that's a good one. Corrective is our super secret code word of the month. Uh, you could also put it into the body of the message as well. And if there was anything else you wanted to put into the body of the message, you're welcome to do that as well. I'm the one reading through these, parsing through them. I have an automated process that once I check and make sure that you have the correct code word for the correct month, I kind of hit one keystroke and it builds out the email and sends it off to you. So you have to make sure you use that exact set of steps. That's why not only is corrective important to know, but the rest of that process is all part of earning the CEU as well. If you don't follow that process, you end up not getting a CEU. And I don't want you not to have a CEU. Now, technically, you don't need my email to be able to verify or at least say that you watch this particular study group. But I always think it's nice to have something that if they do audit you, you can show them, nope, I've got the digitally signed email. It's digitally signed, so I couldn't have changed it. It's from Professor Messer. We have non-repudiation. That's the beauty of Security Plus. You know all of these things now. You know what that digital signature means. You know that nobody else could change the email. You know that it absolutely came from me. And you know that because of all of those cryptography terms that you used in the last section of that. If you just somewhere get in there, your name, your email address, corrective, and September 2019, I will figure it out. But anything more than that sure helps. Sure helps a lot. It doesn't have to be that precise. I'm not, I'm not pedantic about the entire thing. If you come close and I can still automate the process, we're good because then I can get these done. I get quite a few in my inbox. So it's helpful if I'm able to get through them quickly. So thank you for that, by the way. I, and absolutely send those in. I'm more than happy. It usually takes me about a week or so, sometimes faster now. Uh, but be patient. I will get your email back to you. Make sure you have that available and have those things in it. We'll help you a lot as you go through this. Let's go to another q and I've got another question available that we can go through. This question asks, which of the following would be the best way to randomize a stored password? Think through this one. Really put on your thinking cap for this one. Which of the following would be the best way to randomize a stored password? Would it be nonce? Would it be key stretching? Would it be salt? Would it be diffusion? Would it be steganography? So this is a pretty useful one to know. So let's see if you know it. Which of the following would be the best way to randomize a stored password? Would it be nonce, key stretching, salt, diffusion, or steganography? If you think you know the answer, no answering in the chat room, please. You want to go to professormesser.com slash you know it, QA. That will take you right there to be able to have that there. Make sure that you know what these happen to be as you go through these. See if you know. In fact, all five of those are terms you have to know for the exam. As I was building out my practice exam book, writing that over these last number of months, one of the things that always tended to be very similar on the Security Plus exam is they really didn't give you answers that were just fake answers thrown in. Every single one of the answers on the exam was something directly from the exam objectives. So they weren't giving you any gimmies. You really do have to know what all of these different technologies are and be able to understand where they're used. In fact, you may be able to define all five of those a nonce, key stretching, assault, diffusion, and steganography, you may be able to define them, but that wasn't the question. The question says, which would be the best way? And in fact, the best way, very common on the exam is they use those terms. What is the best way? What is the first thing you should do? What is the best way to randomize a stored password? Because there could be multiple answers here that could be a way to randomize a stored password, but that wasn't the question. So make sure that you go through this. Maybe this would be one that you can be familiar with. Which of these would be the best way to randomize a stored password? 
We'll have to figure this one out as we go through it. You folks are really good at answering these really quickly. This is why I wonder. I need to make them really. I'm going to have one of these where it's impossible to get any of these right. That would be the, that'd be the worst study group ever, wouldn't it? Zero percent again gets this one correct. I won't do that to you. I try to get about half 50-50, maybe a little more than that. I try not to make it too crazy. Uh, on this particular answer, if we went 50-50, 56% of you anyway said salt. And if that is the right answer, then that's probably pretty close to what we're shooting for. However, 16% of you said key stretching is the best way to randomize a stored password. 11% of you say it's nonce. 9% of you say it's steganography. And 8% of you say it is diffusion. Well, you have to now think about how passwords are used. How do we store passwords? And secondly, how do we randomize the storage of passwords? As many of you are familiar, you never want to store a password in a way that that password could be recovered. That is the worst thing you could do. Unfortunately, companies have been bit by this many, many times. They think that encrypting the password is the correct thing to do. And in fact, encrypting the password is not the correct way to store a password. The correct way to store a password is going to be something that would hash the password because, as you know from your Security Plus studies, hashing is something that is a one-way ticket. You can't go back. Once you've hashed something, that's it. You can't somehow recover that particular piece of information. But what if you had people that had the same password? What if everybody had the password ninja? This is very common. Or password123. You would be able to look through the hashes and see, oh, we have a lot of hashes that seem to be coming up identical between users. Well, that's not very good for us because if somebody does get their hands on these hashes, they, if they figure out one of those, suddenly they'll know all the hashes for everyone else because there's no randomization. So what you want to do is somehow randomize the hash by adding a little bit of extra information to it, by giving it a little bit of flavor right on the top, by sprinkling it with, I think I've done as much as I can there, with a little bit of salt, by putting some salt on this. Now, a salt is a special kind of nonce. A nonce is a piece of information you use one time and you're done with it. And that's why on this question, it was a very specific term that I used, very specific question to be able to do this uh, and have this here. Salt will randomize that one person's hashed password, which means if everybody in the company used the password ninja, but we were salting all of these passwords, and everybody has a different piece of salt. Everybody uses a different amount of salt. I like a lot of salt. Some people like a little bit of salt. But all the salts are different. So as we look through everybody's hashes, even if everybody had exactly the same password, everybody's hash is different. It's very useful to have that there. Salt, incredibly useful. Every Everybody should be salting their passwords. This should, not, this should be a standard thing that's done. Unfortunately, as we have seen with many of the most recent breaches, the breaches were able to get this information and very quickly be able to identify passwords because nobody was salting their hashes. Should always, always salt the hash and have it there. How many times have you, this happens occasionally pops up, when I will ask to have a password recovered and the company will send me an email with my password. They will tell me what the password was that I originally put on that account. That should never happen. Nobody should have access to that password. That company clearly was not only not salting their password hashes, they weren't even hashing their password hashes. So it's multiple steps to be able to make your password more randomized. And in this question, I asked very specifically, which of the following would be the best way to randomize a stored password? Nonce is a very generic term that doesn't even describe what you would be doing to the password. It is a salt that is a very specific kind of nonce that is specific to passwords. It could be used in other places as well. Salting very often used to be able to uh, do block cryptography encryption and streaming encryption, uh, that is what you would want to be able to do.
So all of this process happens behind the scenes. Yes, you as the end user, you don't know how your password's being stored. You have to trust that the place where you're storing it is first hashing it and then salting that hash. This is why it's always a surprise when we get that email back, oh, you need to reset your password? It's Ninja. Like, how do you know what my password is? You should not know that. Always a chat. That's when you suddenly realize I should not be doing business with that company. Uh, sometimes you just don't know. And there's nobody to ask. If you send in a question to the help desk of that company, do you salt your hashes? They're not going to know. Really a challenge, an ongoing challenge. I know we're at the top of the hour. Let's do another question though, right? Let's do one more Q&A. I think we can get through one more. Absolutely, we should do one. Uh, by the way, if you said key stretching, that's a good way to make an encryption key stronger. But again, with passwords, we are not encrypting anything. We are hashing. So key stretching would not be a correct. Diffusion is a way that we can change the way that information is seen when we encrypt it. And the diffusion that we're doing here uh, is that's not how you randomize a stored password. You salt it to be able to randomize the, store, the, the stored password. In fact, the diffusion is sort of a, a byproduct of that. And we have steganography where we can hide information sort of in plain sight. We hide information. Very commonly, we refer to steganography as hiding information in a picture. So somewhere in that picture, we've hidden our password. You won't know how to see that password unless you're able to use the correct method to pull it out of that graphics file. That's a good way to use steganography. You should not be using steganography to store your passwords. So don't do that for those. So those are the other options that are there. If you chose salt, answer C, 57% of you were spot on. Let's do another question. Here's another question we got here that asks, a security administrator has gained root access to an internal Linux imaging server using a known exploit. Which of the following would best describe this attack? Would it be zero day, penetration test, man in the middle, vulnerability scan, or passive reconnaissance? A security administrator has gained root access to an internal Linux imaging server using a known exploit. Which of the following would best describe this attack? Would it be zero day, penetration test, man in the middle, vulnerability scan, or passive reconnaissance? If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. Professormesser.com slash QA, lock in your answer, and you'll be able to see how we did with this one. This is something that uh, you should absolutely know how to parse those out. All five of those, again, all five of those answers, very common to see on the exam. Those are all five things directly from the exam objectives. So it could be any one of those. So it's helpful not only to know the definition of those, but what do they mean? How do they work? What do they do? It's the deeper second question that you always have to ask of these things to be able to have that there. Make sure you step through each one of these and understand what they are. In fact, if you're reading through those and you think, oh, I don't know what that is exactly, make a note of it. You need to know what that is as you go through this. So make sure you're familiar with these concepts, these ideas as we're going through this. Let's see how you did. Yes, if you're in the chat room asking if there's a Security Plus group, there certainly is. Uh, you are here. Welcome. Thank you for being here. You caught it right at the end, but you got the last question in. A security administrator has gained root access to an internal Linux imaging server using a known exploit. Which of the following would best describe this attack? 64% of you say it's a penetration test. 13% of you say that's a zero day. And then it's a three-way tie for third saying passive reconnaissance, vulnerability scan, and man in the middle is all about 7 or 8%. So which would be the right answer here if we go with the majority, 64% of you say penetration test. Is it really a penetration test? It absolutely is. That's what's going on here. That is what is happening here for this particular answer is it's a penetration test. We are simulating, we are trying, we are working on having this attack actually take place. 
Now, it's a little bit different than a vulnerability scan. A vulnerability scan might have told us this particular server may be susceptible to this particular kind of attack. But a vulnerability scan doesn't actually perform the attack. It goes just far enough, but doesn't actually try to perform an exploit. So this is one where it's very common for companies to perform these penetration tests. Maybe you've run a vulnerability scan that says that server is susceptible. Is it really? Let's do another test where we really try that exploit to see if it really is susceptible, which is exactly what happened here is that the security administrator got root access to this imaging server using a known exploit. And that is the one that's the important part of this is that it's a known exploit. That helps you on this particular question. So this attack is indeed a penetration test. It's not a vulnerability scan because, as we mentioned, there was an actual exploit that was being attempted on this machine. That meant it could not have been a vulnerability scan. It's certainly not passive. If somebody's attacking a machine and sending an exploit to it, definitely not passive. Passive is one where you are doing all kinds of reconnaissance without actually putting any traffic on the network and connecting to that machine. It's very passive. Definitely very passive. Uh, would not be a zero day. 12% of you chose zero day. But in this particular case, the system administrator used a known exploit. This was zero day. This would be an unknown exploit. That means your security administrator is strong with their entire ninja foo security thing that they do. If they happen to have an unknown exploit to this, then that's scary in that. Hopefully, that security administrator has already communicated to the Linux or imaging server company on the exploit that they discovered that nobody happens to know anything about. Because if they did, that would be zero day. But in this case, it was a known exploit, definitely not zero day. And then the last we have here is man in the middle. There's nobody here with man in the middle here. Man in the middle is an attack where somebody uh, is in the middle of a conversation. The security administrator is communicating to a Linux server, and then some unknown individual in the middle grabs what one side is doing, perhaps even manipulates it and sends it off to the other side, or maybe simply looks at what's going by onto the other side. That would be a man in the middle. In this case, it's two machines directly communicating between each other, a security administrator and a Linux imaging server. There's, no, uh, there's nothing in this question that would lead us to believe that there was a third party involved with any of this, so man in the middle would not be the appropriate answer here. The best possible answer on this one is indeed the penetration test. If you're one of the 65% of you that answered penetration test, you got that one absolutely right. All of these questions, by the way, that we've gone through today come directly from the CompTIA Security Plus exam objectives. If you have not downloaded these objectives, you are doing yourself a disservice. You should absolutely go out and get these objectives right now. You can get them at professormesser.com slash objectives. Make sure you have these objectives. They are very, very, very important. Uh, they are a fantastic checklist. And they will tell you exactly what you need to know to pass this exam. Uh, they are great to read through before you start your studies. They should be the last thing you go through before you take the exam just to check off and make sure that you've covered everything you need to cover for this exam. We do one of these study groups every month. This one, we've come to the end of the part where I ask you questions. Stick around. The next hour, you're going to ask me questions. I'll take questions from the chat room. We'll take questions from the phones. We'll have you send that information in. But we'll do another one of these next month. Stop back by for the next Security Plus study group on October 23rd. I have an A-plus study group on the 8th and the 10th. There's a Network Plus study group on the 16th uh, and 23rd of this of October. You can always come back for those to be able to do this. So plenty there to step through with these pieces. Uh, don't forget, my course notes are available at professormaster.com slash security CN. The brand new Security Plus practice uh, exam questions, brand new. Nobody ever heard about them until this study group. So you can check those out at professormesser.com slash security PE for my Security Plus practice exam questions. Don't forget, you can go to YouTube, to Twitter, to Instagram by typing in professormesser.com slash the name of the thing you would like for it to go to. Don't forget about supporting us on Amazon by going to professormesser.com slash Amazon. We appreciate that as well. Thanks for being here this time. We have plenty more to talk about, plenty more things to go through. 
Stick around. We'll do another hour of Q&A that goes my direction right after this. Thanks for being here, though, for this one. We'll see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group. Let's see if I can bring up those phone lines. There we go. Get this here. That was some good Q&A to have that there. I should find those. To get to the Com Compte exam objectives, professormesser.com slash objectives. We'll get you right there. To have that there, let me bring up the phone lines. We'll also take questions from the chat room. So if you're watching on YouTube or you're watching on my website, it'll be that chat room for the YouTube chat room. Oh, thanks for the folks that already have the practice exam. Yeah, I stuck them out there this weekend. I didn't even tell anybody. They were just sort of there. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for grabbing those. I hope it's been a useful thing for you. I'm very proud of that book. I, I really like the content that's in there. I think that's going to help you. Let's get this show started. And I will, first thing I have to do is I have to call into my own show. So this is probably the boring part of the show. As I do that, I have to bring up my Skypey. Bit of an inside joke there. I will call in myself. And it says, oh, I call in, and then I type in uh, a thing there, and it says, I will do that. And I type this in. We're going to see what happens when I do that. Welcome. There we go. So now that that is there, you are able to participate. You're able to call in anywhere in the continental United States. A toll-free number, 855-785-RJ45. 855-785-RJ45. West of the Rockies, 855-785-7545 is what those are, to have those things there. So that should, that should certainly help as you're going through this. So hopefully that will, that will help you as you go through these. Uh, if you're calling in on Skype, by the way, Skype will allow you to call for free anywhere in the world. You put a plus one at the beginning, plus one, 855-785-7545, and you can call in from anywhere in the world to be able to do that. So there's plenty to go through and have those things there. Uh, so from the chat room, we can go through a few questions that have been coming in. You know, one of the real challenges, and I think this was an important consideration that Kyle put in the chat room, is how do you even know how to do some of these things? You know, in this past study group, we talked about hashing and salting. We talked about some of these encryption. We talked about these tools that you would use for dig and trace route. And, but how do you even know to do them? And I think that's important consideration in your studies because there's really four things you need to do for your studies. You need to make sure you have some good videos to watch. Watch my videos or anyone else's. Make sure you have a good book. Books and videos are different. They teach you in different ways. They teach you in different amounts. So make sure you use both of those to be able to have the best possible learning experience. You need to, of course, have plenty of Q&A. See if you really know what you are reading. See if you really know what you are watching in those videos. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, you need to have plenty of hands-on. Perhaps go through a process where you are hashing information, where you uh, digitally sign an email where you encrypt information in an asymmetric encryption and you send that to someone else. In fact, if you wanted to grab my public key and encrypt information, send it to me, I'll see if I can decrypt it and send you a message back as long as you put your key on a public key server and be able to do that. I would be glad to do that. So that would be a good way to test it out. If you wanted to digitally sign an email, if you wanted me to digitally sign an email and send it to you, put that in the message. Maybe when you do, maybe when you receive the continuing education unit credit from me, the, the digital signature is attached to the email. Maybe you can use your asymmetric PGP or GPG program to see if the digital signature is valid. That would be a great way to do it. So make sure as you're going through this that you kind of go through thinking about what what this does and how it works. So go through all of those. Maybe that will help you as well as you go through these pieces uh, and figure out these. Uh, also, uh, here if someone asks, um, so do you have to answer all 90 questions to pass the exam? And here's a good tip for you. You might get 90 questions max. You might get fewer than 90, but you do want to answer all of them. You only get points if you get a question right. 
So at least guess on every single one of them. Never leave a question blank on your exam. That's another important thing as well. So always think about that as you're taking your exam. If you're getting close on the end of time, go through at least put something in. Because taking a guess, if it's multiple choice and it's four options, you got a 25% chance of making some points there. So that can be pretty useful to have that functionality. Let's go to the phone lines, and then we'll come back to some of the questions. We don't believe they subtract for wrong answers. So we don't believe there's a penalty for guessing. Now, they don't tell us that. That is one way to do it. If you're sending me information or you need to validate the digital signature, I'd recommend looking up GPG or PGP. GPG is the, the uh, GNU Privacy Guard. That's a good way to do it. There, first, let's go to the phone lines. The 580 area code. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, yes, sir. My name is Dinestein. I'm calling from Oklahoma. Oklahoma. And, and my question here, oh, sorry. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question here kind of, kind of goes on the line of what we were just talking about. Uh, how do they, uh, I just passed my 1001 today. Um, got a 710. I wanted to, and, and I kind of want to know how they uh, score this. I'm in a, a tech school and I want to kind of educate some of the younger <laughs> kids here. Oh, what a... like, do they score like? Uh, let me give you an let me give you an example. Sure. Example like um, do they do they give you more points for like a, a close wrong answer? One of the questions I had that I don't know if I got wrong or right because it doesn't tell you was um, the tech built a computer, turned it on. Uh, it well, let's not let's not give away minutes, too much touchdown. about the exam itself because you did sign a uh, agreement oh, okay. that you wouldn't give too much away. But we kind of get the the and idea was, of what was, you mean. Right, there were two answers that I thought really thought could have been right. Right. Um, like, yeah. So the. Do you understand what? Yeah, I do. Uh, and here is the real challenge with this. Some of you, if you're looking over my shoulder here, I was typing some things in. I'm going to show you this in just a moment. Is at first, CompTIA does not tell anybody how they grade the exam. And not only CompTIA, but Microsoft doesn't tell you how they grade their exams. Cisco doesn't tell you how they grade their exams. They give very broad descriptions of how they grade these exams, but they do not tell you specifically. Primarily, I think it's more of a trade secret. They don't want somebody else repeating what they do, so they don't give away a lot of the inside baseball that they work on. What we are able to discern from what people have done is we know that you get credit for getting answers right, and as we have seen, we don't believe you get points taken away for getting a question wrong. So at least we know that. We know that guessing doesn't hurt you. If anything, it can only help you in that scenario. The question you have was very specific, and this comes up a lot for questions that are performance-based questions, and they're questions that are answer uh, pick two or pick three. What if you only pick two of the three that are right? Do you get partial credit? Uh, and that's why I was working on this on the side here so you'd be able to see this, is that on the CompTIA website, there is a performance-based questions, frequently asked question that says, is partial credit given if I answer part of a PBQ, policy-based question, correctly? And uh, they they tell you in, in, uh, in ridiculous terms here that uh, the actual answer is there are there may questions, I think they, they meant there may be questions for which partial credit is offered. However, exam questions and their scoring are confidential, so no further information can be provided regarding which questions may are, offer partial credit, which means we aren't going to tell you. Uh, we might give you partial credit. We might not give you partial credit. We're not exactly sure if we are going to tell you that or not. I'm not even sure. That's not even an answer, really. Uh, but it, I guess it's a it's a it's an absolute non-answer. Is is them telling us? Well, we're not going to tell you. We're just not even going right. to let you make make any determination from that. But at least they've they've actually over the years have made that a little bit nicer. It used to be the answer to that question when they first put it up was they used the term rare. It would be rare to get partial credit on performance-based question. I notice they've softened their language a little bit. Maybe they're giving more partial credit now than they used to, but we don't know and we're never going to know. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you, and nobody does except the folks at CompTIA, and they're not saying. 
Okay, well, I appreciate you clarifying that, clarifying that well enough for me. Thank you. And thank you for helping me pass the 1001. I, I don't think I would have done it without your... Um, without your webinars. Well, congratulations. I did the easy part. You're the one that had to take the exam. So congratulations <laughs> for you. I, I guess the 1002 is next for you? Yes, sir. All right. Well, best of luck with that. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. That's fantastic to hear too. Always like when he, people are able to get those exams taken care of. Yeah, it's kind of a challenge because you never know, is there going to be partial credit on these? They just don't tell you. I think they're giving more than they used to, though, for these. I don't know if that's one where it really is the case or it's not the case. I don't know. But uh, we will find out eventually. Uh, quickly, back to the video. Some people are asking, hey, why wasn't this information in your videos? Why didn't you have this information in the video? My videos are taken directly from the CompTIA exam objectives. If it is in the exam objectives, it is in the videos. If it is not in the exam objectives, it is not in the videos. I stay very close to that. And I realize some people would like to go outside the scope of the exam objectives. And I, I agree, you should, and you will in your career go outside that. But I make the videos specifically for the certification. Uh, the question was specifically about port numbers, is that port numbers aren't in my videos. And if you look through the exam objectives, there are no port numbers listed in the exam objectives. But I will tell you that CompTIA has a certain expectation of you taking this exam. And if you read through the first part of the exam objectives, they're expecting you to already have some experience in security, or at least in IT administration and network administration. So there is an expectation that you already know the port numbers. You're doing security now. You're well past the point of memorizing port numbers. You're now at the point of having to configure firewalls. Port numbers is just going to be one of the things you already know. So I think you should go into your exam. If you're if you're looking at some of these protocols that I'm talking about in Security Plus, especially the, uh, the secure protocols, the SSH, the HTTPS, the LDAP-S, the, uh, the RDP type protocols, make sure you know what those port numbers are because CompTIA is just assuming you already know that. So although it's not in the exam objectives, you should probably hone up your skills just a little bit on that to become familiar with them. Hopefully that will help you to be able to get through some of those. They, I wouldn't say that they are no longer required. I'd say they're pretty, pretty required for anything you do in security. Port numbers are incredibly important for security. Hopefully that will help you, Samuel. I'm glad you asked that. It was a good question. Let's go to 406 area code. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, there. It's Paul from Scotland. Hey, Paul. Well, welcome. I just got back from Scotland about a month ago. Had a fantastic time. I wish I was there right now. Uh, thanks for calling. What can we do for you? Oh, I don't know so much. It's, it's maybe not as sunny as where you are at the moment. <clears throat> it is indeed. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> my question is around the, the performance-based questions of the exam and kind of how many we would expect to see on average per exam and, and what would be contained within the, the performance-based questions. This is This is probably one of the top three questions I get all the time is, uh, performance base. It seems like a lot of us are a little concerned about what those could consist of and how many of them you might get. So this is uh, what I what we tend to know. Obviously, we kind of have to collect our stories from everybody taking the exam. But I use the term a handful of questions. Some people have reported in they got three questions. Other people got five questions. Other people got seven or eight. So I guess it's going to depend on the on the roll of the dice whenever you sit into the exam because everybody gets a different exam. It comes from a big pool of questions, and that pool of questions is going to make up the one that you get at that particular time. If you were to take the exam again, it would be a completely different set of questions. But I have noticed they have a subset or a small grouping of performance-based questions, and, and most people are getting somewhere between three and seven. The average tends to be somewhere in five, it seems. These things can, of course, change at any time. Now, the real question, of course, is what are they going to be? What are, the, what are these performance-based questions going to look like? And as it turns out, they're not as uh, crazy as a lot of people might think they are. Most of them tend to be very straightforward. A lot of them are fill-in-the-blank or matching questions like the one we did today. Some are drag-and-drop. Uh, some they might give you, uh, in fact, in my book, I give you an example of uh, here is a network diagram 
here's a, a lot of different buildings, uh, rooms in a building. What type of security should go in the appropriate place in the building? And it's kind of a drag and drop. Uh, so that was one that kind of, it's the same information you already know. You already know what a man trap is. You already know what a fingerprint scanner is. You already know uh, what these security functions are. You already know that there are locks that you can put on a, uh, a rack of equipment. So, oh, here's a rack. Let me put a lock on the front. Here's the front door of the data center. Let me put a fingerprint scanner there. Here's the entrance to the building. Let me put a man trap. So you're not really going well outside the scope of the exam objectives. If you know what's on the exam objectives, you're going to do just fine on the performance-based questions. It's just another way to ask the question. And in many ways, it's a way to get you thinking from different parts of the exam and bring them all into a single scenario or a single exam question. I would not say that they are that difficult if you know the content from the exam objectives. You just have to be ready to be asked the questions in a different way. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that. It's much appreciated. I appreciate your call. Uh, and are you planning to take the Security Plus soon? Is this something that you're working towards? How long have you been studying so far? Certainly, um, kind of a studying on and off for the past kind of a month or two. I'm looking to take the, the exam uh, uh, kind of a post-Christmas, um, post kind of a holiday time uh, is when, when I'd be expected to be kind of ready. So now kind of a three or four months kind of a hard study uh, to get myself ready. Perfect. Well, best of luck with that. You can perhaps get another couple of, uh, of viewings in of, of the study groups before then, and hopefully you'll be ready after Christmas time. Best of luck with that. Yeah, fingers crossed. And, and thanks very much for everything you're doing as well. It's much appreciated. I appreciate the call. Thanks so much. That's, that's something that whenever I start thinking about planning when I take the exam, it takes me about six months. I think the average for Security Plus is probably about, th about three months two to three, somewhere in there for a lot of people, I take a long time to study for certifications. In some cases, I've taken a year. So it just depends on how things are going in, in life to be able to do that. Uh, we have some phone calls holding. Uh, caller, hold just there a moment. We'll take a question from the chat room. Question was, is, uh, is IPS, Nick asks, if, is IPS considered in band or out of band? And the answer is yes. It is considered in band or out of band. It depends on how it's implemented. I would say in the vast majority of implementations, an intrusion prevention system is almost always going to be installed in band. Why would you be installing something to prevent traffic if you are only going to limit the type of traffic you would be able to prevent? So in band is the best place to put it. That way, if traffic is seen that is malicious, it can be blocked before it gets to the inside of the network. Now, there are ways to block traffic with an IPS that is out of band. How would you do that? For, uh, for those of you familiar with the TCP protocol, you know there are ways that TCP can send a message to stop communication, send a reset to the other side to say, we're done communicating with this. And so by putting an IPS outside of the network communication, where we're simply getting a copy of that communication, we call that out of band communication, because it's not sitting in line with the normal traffic. We are sitting out of band. And if it happens to notice that a copy of the traffic it's received is malicious, it can send one of those TCP resets off to the device so that connection is suddenly severed. Now, obviously, that's occurring a few packets after the fact, and it's only going to occur for traffic that is TCP-based. UDP traffic does not have a reset. So an out-of-band detection or prevention system would not be able to prevent anything for UDP traffic, which is why we really just don't use IPSs out-of-band. There used to be a time when the IPS provided uh, a single point of failure. It couldn't keep up with the network traffic. There was performance issues associated with putting a device in band. Uh, people felt that it was blocking legitimate traffic and it would become a, a problem. But these days, IPSs are very mature. They are extremely powerful util tools. Uh, they're made to go at multi, in some cases, tens of gigabits of speed. Uh, all of those concerns that were in the past are, are no more. 
Those don't exist any longer. You can very easily tune these devices these days to protect you, but still allow good traffic to go through. So that's that's something to think about as you're going through these pieces. Uh, let's go back to the calls. The 240 area code. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey there. My name is Brett. I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. Hey, Brett. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you? So my question is more regarding kind of like next steps once we get through uh, this exam and pass it and get through all our celebration and whatnot. <laughs> um, kind of gauging what um, the next, the best next step should be as far as what to pursue. Um, I've, you know, kind of been on help desk for three years. I've had my A plus and N plus for a while. And I was kind of just taking it to security plus to kind of round it out and kind of get a feel for what security could be like. But um, it still seems kind of murky out there. Like it's a big commitment, I guess, to take a step into like a security position and kind of be in there for a while and maybe realize it's not what you wanted to do. So is it, do you have any advice in kind of like gauging or uh, any tools or resources to kind of figure out what the next best certification would be or uh, if it's best to kind of like try out a job for a while and then kind of see if that's what you want to keep doing? Well, the, Is there any kind of clarification you can give on that? I, I th There is. And there's a couple of ways you can go about doing this. I can give you my perspective as someone who worked in the industry in doing server administration, networking, uh, systems engineering, both uh, from a networking perspective and from a security uh, company, uh, and doing these implementations of next generation firewalls and putting in these cloud-based sandboxes and being able to do this cloud-based malware detection. And those were remarkable technologies, and I really enjoyed working on them. But after you've now taken your Security Plus, you pass the exam, the heavy drinking is over, you wake up the next day and shake off whatever happened that night before, and now what do you do? Is a, It's a very common question. You've got, first, you're, you're in this situation that is probably one of the best that you could be in, which is you have a very solid certification to the entry level in the security world, and you happen to be working, or you happen to be living at least currently in a geography in the United States where that particular kind of certification is at a, 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 a high demand. People want you to have that cert. But you also have to think about what you want to do in your career. IT is extremely broad. You could be doing server administration and uh, implementations your entire career and do extremely well. You could do the same thing for databases. You could do the same thing for network administration and design. You could do the same thing for security administration and design. So there's kind of a balancing act where you get to decide, what do I like doing? And that is something where you balance it out with, where can I take this or where are the opportunities coming from? Because that, of course, is going to be important as well. If you were someone who spent their career learning COBOL programming on mainframes, you would probably be looking to make a change. Uh, you don't want to be in that situation. <laughs> but one of the things I found in this industry is IT doesn't let you do that. IT doesn't ever let you be stagnant. Things are changing so quickly under your feet that if you've been working with servers, you're now working in virtualization and uh, working with very high-end systems. If you were working on networking, you're now designing some of the most advanced networks that have ever been. Uh, if you were doing security, you're now working what a market that is right now to be working in anything relating to IT security. So one of the things advantages you have in IT is you can kind of Follow the path wherever it takes you. And if you want to nudge it a little bit to see if you can go to the left or the right side of the river as you're going down that stream, that helps as well, too. Uh, what you will find, because you you mentioned Help Desk and then you mentioned Security Plus, but there's a gap right in the middle of this that I think is very important for people that want to get into IT security. And that is you're expected to be an expert in networking when you get into these IT security roles. If you think about it, you're implementing a firewall. It's very often a layer three device. You're doing routing. You may be sitting at the edge of the network where there's BGP routing on the outside. You may be doing static routing or uh, 
EIGRP or some other type of OSPF on the inside. You have to put in this technology usually with two multiple redundant firewalls. Sometimes it's in, uh, engineered as an active-active configuration. Sometimes it's engineered as active-passive. Each one of those is designed differently, needs to be engineered differently, is implemented differently, and the configurations on the inside of your network are going to be different depending on how you implement those. That firewall is not only going to be doing that layer 3 routing. It will be your primary firewall. It will probably be doing IPS these days. It may be doing cloud-based malware detection. It may be your SSL VPN endpoint. These devices do multiple things. So I kind of spewed that out very quickly just to give you an idea that everything I just mentioned is a networking engineering problem. None of what I really just mentioned had anything to do with security yet. It was all just getting the devices right. plugged into the network, understanding these very advanced routing technologies, understanding how to how to get them implemented with the existing routers and switches that are being used. So all of those things require an extremely strong foundation in networking. I would say being a network expert is almost required if you want to be in IT security. And as I've seen through the years, as I myself have moved from network systems engineering into security systems engineering, what I found is the people I used to talk with on the networking side – I would then go in to talk with a company on the security side, and it was the same people. They had also moved from networking into security. <laughs> it seems to be a very common path to move that way. One of the things that I found in the industry also, and this might help you, is that the need for security professionals has exploded. There's a big demand for security professionals. Companies are starting to hire people at lower levels in security and kind of train them up because nobody's available. So you may not need the, the same level of IT expertise or networking expertise you needed in the past to move into security just because there were a lot of positions now that need to be filled and companies are changing the structures for those things. So the, the other question you mentioned, and this is sort of a question that everybody deals with is what if I get into this and it's just a horrible place to be? Uh, well, I've been in plenty of those in my career, and I can tell you one of the advantages you have in IT is you just don't do that anymore. If you find yourself in a position where you are supporting either a technology or a group of people or a company that you aren't really welcome at, there are plenty of other companies out there. There are plenty of other technologies out there. And you will be so skilled in what you are doing that you will find that it's actually relatively easy to make a move in IT, which is something that if you worked in any other part of, uh, of a, a type of career, if you were in transportation, if you were in medicine, if you were in manufacturing, you would not have the same flexibility. IT gives you an amazing amount of flexibility. Don't be worried that you're ever going to find yourself in a bad place because you might. In my career, I have found myself in some pretty bad situations. Sometimes you get into a company, there's a management in place, things are great. Then the company sells to someone else. They fire all the managers. They bring new managers in. That's normal, by the way. The constant change mm -hmm. in this industry. But it turns out they're different people. They have a different philosophy on how to run things. Doesn't match with your philosophy. So you leave and you go to the next thing. The, for the fortunate thing for us and the skills that we have in IT is we can do that. We are never locked in anywhere. If they fire you, if you leave, if something changes in your career, it's never the end of the world. It's the beginning of the next thing. Uh, it'll be it'll be sad for a day. Oh, I, that was such a great job back in the day. Yeah, I'm going to go do this now. Oh, and they gave me a raise. And now I do what the next thing is going to be. In my career, I probably had total from the time I really got out of college to the time I started doing this full time. I probably had 15 different positions. We counted them on an earlier study group back in the day. And I had 15 different jobs. Sometimes those jobs were different jobs within the same company where I moved from position to position. Sometimes those jobs, I moved from place to place. So I've worked for value-added resellers. I worked for an insurance company. I worked for a, uh, a network analyzer company, and that was bought by another company. And I had probably 
five jobs within that same company. I worked for a call center outsourcing company. I went back to the protocol analysis company. I then moved to a security company. So worked for, what is that, six or seven different entities, and within that had different jobs within them. It's a beautiful place to be. Do never, never worry in this industry that you will ever be in a position where it just isn't working out and things you've made the horrible decision because you have it. You just go do the next thing and you're good to go. All right. Thank you so much. That is extremely helpful. Best of luck, Brett. You're going to do fine. All right. Thank you. This is this is one of the things I, I, I'm fortunate enough that I've been through the sort of the I've been through some of the worst types of situations with acquisitions and changes and being thrown out on your ear and uh, and through through just various comings and goings in this industry. I was around in these technology industries during the internet boom, and it was just ridiculous. Um, there was so much change. And you got to a point, though, and if you can sort of grab this and, and stick it on you somewhere, which is, yeah, change is going to happen. It's going to have, sometimes it's a great change. Sometimes it's not a great change. It doesn't matter. Just roll with it. Sometimes you can make the best of it. Sometimes you have to leave and go somewhere else. And that's okay. That's just fine. That's probably normal these days for what we do. Uh, you should always do what's going to be the best thing for you. You should always do what's going to be the best thing for your family. Uh, you're, and in, there's so much opportunity here that you never er, are ever feeling that you're in a position where you're taking advantage of someone else or that you are missing out on something because there's so many different things you can be doing. That's why I often tell people, find the thing you're really interested in, go do that. Because if you someday kind of get tired of that, you'll go find something else you're interested in. And that's kind of my in my positions. I started off in really on the workstation, the operating system, move to the network server, move to the network, move to security. It was kind of a, a common common path, I think, of where you would go. Uh, and that's true. Like uh, Web Sandy says in the chat room, as soon as you think you know everything, everything changes. And that's I think that's the great thing about IT is that you can become an expert in a thing, and that is extremely valuable but make sure you keep becoming the experts in the thing. Uh, now there's virtualization. There's containerization. There's a whole set of cloud-based technologies that people, all of us, are now trying to learn. So that's another advantage you have is you can't go back and find the person who has been in this industry 20 years and think that they have a leg up because they're just learning it too. It's one of the challenges we have with this is you got to keep up with everything. Uh, and I love it. I think that's a great thing. You never are ever knowledgeable in everything. You will never know everything. In fact, you should always be uncomfortable. If you're in an IT position and you find out, oh, this is so boring. I know everything I need to know for this job. You're in the wrong job. You should have already moved somewhere else by then. So update your resume. Get it out there. Go to the next thing. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. Let's go to the next caller. For 212. Hello, caller. Which name are you calling from? Hey, uh, this is Freddie. Hey, Freddie. What can we do for you? Hey. So, um, I passed the, um, the security class. Nice. Congratulations. I have, zero knowledge. I have zero knowledge in IT. Yep. <laughs> so, I'm stuck with this uh, certification, and I don't know what to do next. <laughs> this, is, this is probably a good position to be in, and depending on where you are in the, in the world... This can be pretty useful to you. Now, as I mentioned, it's also a bit of a disadvantage. I mentioned earlier that there, there are not a huge number of entry-level security positions available to go through. There's, a, there's an increasing number. Companies are starting to be a little more flexible. But if you go to Dice.com, LinkedIn, uh, any of the big, uh, the big sites that have job postings, you'll find... There's not a lot of entry-level security jobs out there because security is not an entry-level position. It's not. It really is requiring you to know a lot about operating systems and networking and, uh, and servers, kind of put it all together in one place. So here you are. You've now got the Security Plus cert. 
Uh, this actually, you may be able to find an entry level position in a security operations center, a SOC, we call it, SOC, very similar in, in nomenclature and style to a NOC, a network operations center. Uh, but there are operation centers that do nothing but security focus. Or you may be able to find an entry level position for companies doing technical support for a security product. That's a great place to start learning about these technologies and how they would fit. So it's not that it's worthless. It's just that now you have to figure out how do you use this to its best benefit. And you may have to add something to it. You may find that companies are really looking for someone that has a Network Plus or has an A Plus or has Microsoft certification or has Cisco certification along with the Security Plus. Every company is going to be different. Every job posting is going to be different. So you're going to have to kind of see how that works. In your particular scenario where you are, you're in a situation where there is a company that they they are, you've now got a certification and now what do you do with this? How is that going to work to have this and is, have this available in this situation? You really should probably look at the job postings in your area and see what makes sense for you. I think that is going to help you probably the most as you start going through what you're going to do next with these things. All righty. Thank you so much. And um, also, thank you so much because I pass with all your materials. Fantastic. And I just use it. Yeah, I just use it for like a month and a half. Thank you. <laughs> best, of, best of luck. I think you're going to do fine. I appreciate the call. That's always a good position to be in, though, isn't it? That you're, you've got this, you've got the certification. It is a certification that is, is well uh, people really want that. It's well in demand. Uh, you should absolutely uh, do this um, and, and really go through the process of getting the cert. But there should be an end game with this as well. And maybe that's a good thing that all of us can do is to probably look at where we are going with this. It doesn't help to have the cert and not have somewhere to go with this. Before you take the certification, you should probably have an idea what this is going to do for you. Uh, the certification is not your end game. The certification is the, the, the thing that gets you down the path. So try to think about it that way as well. I think that might help for those of you that are in the process of wondering, do I even take the Security Plus? Do I not take the Security Plus? What are you trying to do? You know, that's really what the important part is, is trying to get it to, to really do that. Uh, hopefully that's something that can, can help you as well with all of these. Let's go back to the calls, bring up some of these. Oh, we, we're doing fine with the calls. I'm going to let the calls queue up there as we go. Let's go back to the chat room for all of these. So this is one. Well, you need a question I was talking specifically about, um, about the SOC, the Security Operations Center. Will you need a certification for an entry-level job in the SOC? IT is a little different with its certifications than a lot of people are uh, in, in a lot of those environments. One of the things you'll find, for example, um, is that if you, were, uh, getting, if you were in nursing and you went and got your nursing certification, you have to have that certification to actually go into a hospital and be a nurse. IT doesn't work that way. An IT certification is something that tells people that you did something that gives you some knowledge. It's a badge that you could put on that says, hey, I know the minimum requirement to pass the certification exam. And by the way, for Security Plus, that's a pretty good badge. You have a very good knowledge of these security technologies. But a lot of companies, some companies want you to have that badge. Some companies don't care. In fact, some companies have the philosophy of if you don't have a Security Plus, I can pay you less and then I'll train you as we go which is not a bad philosophy. It actually is a pretty good idea for the people that don't have Security Plus. Other companies don't have time for that. They don't have time to train you on these basics of security. They want you to walk into the building already knowing what an IPS is, what these different types of authentication factors are, and how, these sort of, how the basics of cryptography work. And in those cases, they're willing to pay if you already have the Security Plus certification. So go through and see what people are asking for before you even get to the point of taking these certification exams. And I think that will help you too as you go through and figuring out, do, do I need to get this to get the job? It depends. 
find out what that that uh, that employer is looking for. That's why I often tell people, you should already know this before you walk in the door. And you should already know some people who are there before you walk in the door. Uh, go to some of the, the ISSC, ISSA, there's a security user group you may want to go to. Go to a Palo Alto Networks user group. Go to a Checkpoint user group. Uh, go to a VMware user group, a Microsoft user group, a Cisco user group. Meet those people because every single one of the people in those user groups works for an organization that is local in your area. And every single one of those organizations has open positions, has security professionals, has networking teams, has a help desk. Knowing those people can be the difference when you walk in the door. Plus, you get to talk to them and say, oh, you work at company A? Uh I'm I'm interested in uh, some of the things you're doing there. I'd love to put in a job posting with you. What are the things that you're looking for in your help desk? What are the things your security operations center needs? Uh, do they like people to have a security plus? Do they not? Do you know who I should talk to? Who should, can I give you my resume? Uh, and that's one of the things you may want to do as well. A lot of people don't even realize this. I mention this from time to time. In most companies, they will ask you as an employee to please give resumes from people you know. In fact, there is usually some type of finder's fee so that if you give a resume to HR and HR ends up hiring that person, you get money for it. And you'll find if you go out to LinkedIn, a lot of people say, yes, give me your resume. They're almost, they, they will pull people's resumes. They'll just get them in a big pile and send them off to HR, hoping that one of those people will be hired. So very often the people you meet at these user group meetings are happy to take your resume because they now know you from the user group. They can pass that off to HR. If you get hired, you'll get a job and that person will get a few hundred bucks and everybody's happy. So there's, there's actually a financial incentive for people to get to know you. So make sure that everybody can be happy. Make sure that you're able to be available to those folks so they can put in those types of job positions. Uh, becomes really useful to have that too, I think. Uh, you, you often almost forget that that capability, that function is there, that these companies have that. Uh, it's one of those things that, uh, that can really help you and help someone else at the same time. So take advantage of those things. They're absolutely there and available to work with. Well, we've got, we've gone through an hour of Q&A. We've gone through an hour of you asking me questions, almost an hour of you asking me questions. But I think since my, my voice is on its way out, that's probably my warning sign to close things out for the month. Thank you for being here. We had a great first hour, I think, of the questions. We, we love doing those. Thank you for your calls and your questions in the chat room as well. This is one of those times where I, I'm able at least connect out and, and see how things are going out there in the world. And I thank you for, for being here on the live stream. I thank you for watching the replays. Thank you for your support of the website. We could not do this without you. Uh, stick around or, or come back in a month. We have our next Security Plus study group. And, of course, if you're someone who's working on your A Plus and your Network Plus, I do study groups for those at the beginning of October as well. We'd love to have you come back for those and see you on the live stream as well. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group.